case, let me continue with some uh, remark on limits in general. This is basically just a language that one can use to, to think about limits. Uh, so I, I won't go into the precise details. I have a small paper on this uh, on archive, it's not, not archive, it's an Oberwolf report, so if you're interested in this. But so here is the thing. So if you have a family of objects, say graphs or zero one sequences or hypergraphs, or I will tell you more examples, Boolean functions, whatever. And assume that you have sampling processes and the meaning of it is that these are functions, probability distribution valued functions. So if f is one of these discrete structures uh, then for every k, you can evaluate as k on f. And it also gives you an object in the family. Sorry? And it also gives you an object in the family. That I don't assume, no. but in many cases, you actually get that for graphs, as you will see. And the value of it is a probability measure on a sampling space. You will see examples where this is not an element from the family, but this is, this is, uh, this is interesting, actually. On a sampling space, which is xk. And uh, so we typically assume that this sampling space is compact. That helps, you will see why. But in most cases, it actually it's finite. Uh, exactly, that's the setup. So these are just sampling processes. You, you imagine these, these, these structures as typically large structures that you want to understand by sampling small samples from them. Uh, and the example from last time, the ergodic theory example, is when you have these uh, zero one sequences, that's the family of the uh, that's the family F, all zero, all finite zero one sequences. And uh, then the sampling processes are uh, just sampling consecutive, K consecutive elements uniformly at random. And uh, once you have this language, you immediately have a convergence notion, of course. So the convergence notion is general, doesn't depend on that example. Let me put it here. So such a sequence from the family is convergent if for every k, Uh, the distributions uh, uh, SKFI converge in the weak topology. Weak topology of probability distributions. So again, this means that you, for every fixed continuous function on xk, the integral of that according to these measures will converge. So the xk is also the Maxwell sequence? Uh, well, uh, yes, I will get to that point. I, I, in this language, these are just independent spaces. Each, k, each xk is a compact space. But uh, in, in most of the situations, there will be an interesting connection between them, which, which, which makes the language actually nicer and stronger. The phase function and the phase function need to be defined simultaneously and 
know what to do. Uh, so xk is a fixed space. Let's say uh, if you are in this example of ergodic theory, then say x3 is just 0, 1 to the 3. It's a fixed space. So it, it's, it's not a function of f. So we have these uh, sampling processes and corresponding sampling spaces. This is a fixed situation. So in this situation, x3 is just 0, 1 to the 3. Now we have a convergence notion, but. What in this example, I mean, the graphs, for example, the spaces are discrete, right? And then the convergence has been the probability of the single point on the x3. Exactly. Yeah. So in that situation, this is. Uh, because, because the characteristic functions of, of individual elements are continuous on that space. So, but actually it turns out that it's interesting to consider compact spaces when, for example, you have a graph where the edges are labeled by elements from the zero one interval, which is a compact interval. Then you again can sample from it and then you get a samples from, uh, in a compact space. So, um, of course, using that language um, in this situation, we get back the, the convergence notion that I defined. But there is an interesting feature here, an extra feature, namely that the sampling processes somehow form an inverse system, kind of. So there is this forgetting map between the sampling spaces, then you just delete a coordinate. And the sampling, uh, uh, like, it turns out uh, that the sampling processes, if you evaluate them, uh, are forming also an inverse system in this, uh, in this language. Meaning that if you project down that probability distribution to when you delete that element, you get this probability distribution. Well, this is not exactly true. To, to make it exactly true, I have to slightly change f. If I say that these are cyclically ordered 0, 1 sequences, and then you uh, sample consecutive elements, then it's precisely true that you can get back the three samples by first uh, considering a fourth sample and then deleting the last coordinate. Okay? So this is already an example where the sampling uh, spaces are not identical with the object because the objects are cyclically ordered zero one sequences, but they are almost the same. So in this case, it's not a good example for that. Yes? So maybe all you need, since it's very clear to winner, maybe all you need is uh, this map is too clear for the winner distribution? Yeah, so, so in the limit, actually, you don't need to consider the size. In the limit, this problem disappears. Uh, so th that's why I'm saying it's not a good example. There are better examples for the case where the sampling spaces are not identical. Uh, you will see a much better example. Uh, anyways, uh, so, so okay, um, once you have this property, uh, there is a very natural thing to do. Assume that you have a sequence of structures, f1, f2, and so on. So each structure has this sequence of probability distributions. So now I have a matrix of probability distributions. And of course, when I take the limit, the limiting probability distributions will still form an inverse sequence like that, inverse system. So the, you can take somehow the inverse limit of that system, and you can just take, it's, it will be a single uh, probability distribution on the space, which is the inverse limit of these xi's. So this is a way of thinking about uh, this general limit object that I described you last time. And uh, it's really nice to think about it this way because there are other examples where, where the same inverse uh, limit situation happens. Example two is a... Con yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah, I tell you. Uh, so the thing is, is that um, of course, you could, you, could, you could consider the limit object as just the collection of the limiting probability distributions. But in this case, when this consistency holds, there is a way of gluing all those probability distributions together into one single infinite object. 
and how you. The correspondence principle? The uh, it's basically the correspondence principle. And what you do is uh, the formal language is this to, to make it entirely precise. First, just take the product of all the xi's. This is a compact topological space by Kionov theorem. And take the subspace of all those uh, sequences, little x1, little x2, and so on, which form a consistent sequence. So uh, all these restrictions are, uh, all these maps are continuous. So this kind of, uh, this subset of vectors is a closed subset. So that's the inverse limit of those sampling spaces. And then on that uh, inverse limit, you can, uh, define, you, can, you can define a probability distribution, which is a single object, yes? If the xi's are finite, then it's much simpler, right? So you're just saying you set some distribution on x1, pick something according to that distribution, that induces on, in x2, that in, there's a set of values that map to that value, pick according to the conditional distribution Um, I think that's the same, defines the same object. It's still an infinite object, so you get this inf nice infinite language. The advantage is that, uh, I mean, the advantage in ergodic theory is something that I explained last time, that in the limiting situation, you can detect algebraic structures which uh, arise. So anyways, example two is, uh, was introduced by Benjamin and Schramm, or that Schramm. Uh, it's a beautiful example. So here the family of objects is bounded degree graphs. So we will fix a natural number uh, D. Um, so for, for this uh, fix a natural number D. But they define, by the way, is a slightly more general, but, but this, this illustrates already the construction. Uh, so then FD is the set of, of graphs, set of finite graphs with maximal degree at most D. And uh, of course, once you have such a graph, there is a natural sampling process. You can figure out what it is. You take a root, uh, you take a point with the uniform distribution. <coughs> so now I'm describing S K. Pick V in the vertex set with uniform distribution. Uh, and then look at the neighborhood of radius k of v. Then take take this neighborhood. The uh, take the induced graph uh, on the neighborhood. Uh, so what you get is a rooted object. It will be a rooted graph because we want to keep track of the chosen point. So Again, it, it's almost the same object as, it's almost from the family, but not quite, but it will be a rooted object. So it, uh, xk uh, is now a rooted set of rooted graphs, a graphs with a distinguished point with of radius uh, K at most k, and uh, of of course again maximum degree is at most d. It's a finite set because uh, obviously because the degree condition, um, and uh, we get a probability distribution on that. There is by the way another natural probability distribution which is useful here. You can also take the probability distribution, uh, the uniform, uh, sorry, the stationary distribution on the, of the random walk on these graphs. That defines a similar limit object, which has a bit nicer properties, uh, but it's, the two languages are basically equivalent. So now, 
once you have this setup, you already have this uh, limit notion, which is just the Benjamini Schramm convergence. And uh, again, in this situation, we have the consistency, because if you know uh, the sampling SK plus one, then you obviously just delete the points of distance K plus one and you get SK. So, so you have the inverse limit situation, you, you, you can glue these things together. Now here is the question for you, what will be the space, what will be this space? Uh, I think this is the way how we uh, denote inverse limit, what is this? Puzzle for you. Not trees, but infinite rooted graphs. Uh, so, so there will be a root, uh, and so it's 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 infinite, possibly infinite, could be finite also. Does not matter, but infinite. Uh, uh, but but these are connected graphs. So infinite connected graphs with a root and uh, of maximal degree D. And if you think about this space, there is a topology. You can describe this topology in a very natural way in this context. Uh, of course, my language uh, forces a topology on this space, but, but what is this topology? The open sets are just sets where you fix a certain ra uh, radius. I mean, this will be a generating set for the open sets. You fix a K and you fix a graph that you want to see on that neighborhood and then you let the rest run through all possible graphs. That those will be, those will form a basis. Um, but should that be all the set of finite graphs or? Sorry? Or, or B? I mean how? That max degree at most D and uh, so there is a root and connected. Space. These are the, yeah. okay. so this is the space. Now, okay, we have a probability distribution of rooted graphs here in this sense. That's the limit object. Uh, by the way, this is a general phenomenon that this kind of limit object is always some kind of probability distribution on infinite versions of similar objects as the original objects. In the Furstenberg situation, this was probability distribution on infinite zero one sequences. Here it's probability distribution on infinite graphs Plus we have a root, so it's not exactly the same, but almost. Uh, and, um, but here is the question, what kind of probability distributions can we see in the limit? Not everything. There is, there is a certain algebraic condition. Remember that in example one, we had the condition that the probability distribution was shift invariant. Now there is a similar condition here. And it's, it's, uh, it's a bit, uh, with this language, it's a bit tedious to describe, but if I use, instead of the uniform distribution, just the stationary distribution of the random walk, then there is a beautiful way of this. Oh, on the stationary distribution of the random walk of the just finite graph. On that finite graph. How you fix this? Exactly. So in, in particular, if this is a regular graph, then this is the same as the uniform distribution. It's proportional to the degree. It's for proportional to the degree. And, uh, uh, but, so there is a reason why we chose the that, because the, somehow it's, uh, it will be related to the random work on this infinite object. The nice, uh, consist, the nice algebraic uh, property is that if you, so assume you have a limiting distribution mu, it will be random work invariant in the following sense. If you choose an element from mu uniformly at random, and then you move the point, the root, uh, randomly to a neighbor, you replace the root, uh, then that's a new probability distribution. It's, it's generated in two steps. First, I pick a new random element, and then I, uh, in a second round of randomization, I replace the root, mu star, then mu star has to be equal to mu. It's obvious from uh, the properties of the random walk. If I pick a uh, random walk stationary point, then I replace the root, it will be again a random stationary. So um, this is the consistency, uh, I mean, this is the algebraic property. Yeah? Can you define again the, the, the sampling? Is it a fixed graph or do you pick a random graph and then a random root? No, uh, SK is a sampling process which makes sense for every uh, bounded degree graph. So the, the sampling process is the following. So if you give me your favorite graph, which has degree at most D, 
then SK of G will be a probability distribution on that space, which is obtained by first taking a root, uniform at random, then take the neighborhood of radius K, and that, that distribution is a probability. So you get a probability distribution from any fixed graph. Um, It is shift invariant, yes. And by the way, the two uh, ways of looking at this are almost the same because uh, it turns out that the two measures that you get in the limit are somehow absolutely continuous in each other. So. The trouble is that if you take the stationary distribution, then you don't see isolated numbers. Isolated. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, so this is assume that everything is connected. Yeah, yeah. I, basically, well, so everything is connected here, assume, and then. Uh, yeah, but but then if it's uh, then 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 if you just take a sequence of isolated points, then it's the limit is one point, and then it's absolutely continuous. So. Uh, Oh, no, no, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I say is that, uh, okay, that, uh, uh, if I just restrict myself to connected graphs here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. So anyway, so basically absolutely continuous, so it's, uh, uh, so, and, and there is a transformation which produces one from the other, so it's, it's basically the same limit. If I know one, then you know the other, basically, so there is a way of going uh, back and forth. And uh, actually, we used this in a proof with Omer Angel. We, we brought something about limits of uh, excluded minor graphs. Uh, and uh, there, we actually use this thing that we go back and forth between them. Some, some statements are easier in this measure. I'm sorry, not, it's, I'm pointing at the wrong place. Some, some, uh, some uh, statements are easier in the stationary picture. Some statements are easier in the uniform picture. So you can go back and forth, doesn't matter. By the way, just a historical remark that Benjamin and Schramm uh, use this convergence notion to prove that if you take a sequence of planar graphs in this language, then the limit object will be recurrent with probability one. So this probability distribution on, on, on graphs uh, with new probability one, what you see is a recurrent graph, meaning that if you start a random walk at the root with probability one, it goes back. It's a beautiful theorem. So with Omer Angel, or Angel, I think that's a better pronunciation. Uh, because, uh, yeah, because it's not an English name. <laughs> anyway, so we proved that the same statement holds for excluded minor graphs. So if you exclude some minor, uh, it's, it uses the characterization of, of those graphs. It's a complicated characterization. So both graphs have the same limit? Uh, planar graphs. But if so, so Benjamin Nishan proved it in a beautiful way with circle packings for planar graphs, and then uh, using that and some characterization of excluded minor graphs, you can pr push it uh, uh, through for for these graphs. Anyway, so are there more elementary ways of proving that? I mean, so does the existence of large grid minors give you anything in some of these planar graphs? So if you have like a you know large planar graph with you know reasonable tree width, then you can always find a large uh, grid minor inside of it. Okay. I. So you think the tree needs a hole to pass very much uh, space? Yeah. Yeah, because grid minor can have such a very different path length between the the the, the, the vertex the, the vertex yeah. of the tree, and that would mean that. Uh, We use separate. Uh, we use separators. That's one thing that we use. Another thing we use, of course. Um, so these excluded minor graphs are uh, glued together as click sums in a tree-like fashion from uh, from these low genus graphs. The low genus graphs can be treated by separators, but somehow it's surprisingly hard. And there are, there are phase decorations also in these graphs. You have to treat the phase decorations. There, are, there can be large phases when you put a certain 
decoration. So that, that's one thing that you have to understand. Then you have to understand the click sums, what happens when you take click sums and so on. Proof turns out to be surprisingly technical. So you can, you can imagine the proof, but if you want to do it, it turns out to be extremely so, technical. Uh, so both for planar and for excluded minor, I mean, at least in a finite case, you have you know, eigenvalues bounds to them, which give you the good separators that, uh, so yeah. are there examples of finite graphs which satisfy the same you know, eigenvalue bound in finite cases that aren't recurrent? I'm I don't know about this direction. I oh, mean, okay. the, the, the relationship between eigenvalues and, uh, and recurrence itself, I don't know. We just, use, uh, we just use separators as an input for the proof. Well, we, don't, guess, uh, we didn't go into the depths of the separators. Uh, we, just, we just use the fact that uh, you can separate those. Oh, that's a good question. So, so even a weaker statement is assuming the eigenvalue. I think that that, that, that becomes a, a good question. So if you just know things about the separators, whether you can prove anything. But you, but you have to know separators are of size order root n. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you get that from the eigenvalue bound, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for all these finite cases, you get one over you know, n for the eigenvalue bound. Yeah, I mean, it follows the eigenvalue as well, but it follows. I mean, you can follow it. Oh, no. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know. I don't know about statements which just deduce recurrence from knowing something about the separator. Separators in our proof occupy a very small part. Uh, the, 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 main, the main proof is very structural, the main part of the proof. It's using uh, actu actually the structure theorem of ex excluded minor graphs. You have to, there are certain phase decorations, a bounded number of phases. So you have some low genus graph and the bounded number of phases can be decorated in a certain fashion. So you have to understand the limit of those. Then you have to understand what happens in the limit when you take the click sum of things, then you have to prove lemmas. And the, the philosophy is quite clear, but it's annoying. The proof gets annoying. So you have to prove various things. I, I can, I think we even considered the uh, uh, conjecture like that, but I, I don't know what to think about that. So I, I agree with you, but I, I don't know, I wouldn't dare to say that this guarantees. Another question is, what about a tree? Because a tree is not a statement. So what about, I mean, if I start from trees, uh, just by name, yeah, that's a good example. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful example. Yes, that's the thing. So if you look, these are planar. Uh, actually, it's, it's good that you bring it up because, because this, is a, this illustrates this convergence notion. So this is a convergence sequence. And the limit object could be, uh, I mean, first intuition would be, it's just the infinite three regular three where the root is placed here. And it contradicts the theorem. Actually, the, in fact, the, the limit object is the following. With probability one, so it will be a probability so this. Probability half, exactly. So you have this graph, so it has leaves, and then with probability one half, you are at this level, one quarter here, and so on. So that's, that's a, it's a discrete, I mean, it's a countable uh, supported probability distribution this, in this case. Okay, so. And, and that will be recurrent. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a very neat thing that uh, that that this is recurrent. This this kind of tree is recurrent. Um, okay. So is everything clear on this picture? So that then I move on. Uh, the next example is uh, finite arbitrary graphs. So for trees, we still know that the answer is true, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, do, do you know if we try on the infinite uh, Markov theorem? Sorry? 
the mu is defined on the infinite domain? Exactly. I, I mean, there is a uh, mu is defined on the on, on the one space, which is the inverse limit of this xi. It's it's one space. It's the space of all infinite, possibly infinite rooted graphs that are connected and have maximal degree at most d. So that is one space, and and the limit object it can be uh, regarded as a probability distribution on that space. So every single infinite uh, graph will be have a zero. Uh, not always. So it can the probability measure could con be concentrated on a single graph. For example, you can, and the example for that is that if you take larger and larger girls graphs, say you have three regular graphs with increasing uh, girls, then the, the limit object is uh, a probability distribution which is concentrated on the three regular infinite tree. It's, it has only one atom. So that's an interesting example as well. Or if you take vertex transitive graphs, then again the probability distribution will be concentrated on a single <laughs> infinite vertex transitive graph. <laughs> Let me mention here a, a one more interesting thing. It is not clear that all these mu's appear as limit objects uh, which have this consistent. I mean, it is clear, I tell you, the, so there are two things here. One thing here is that, unfortunately, it is not true that all these mu's which have this consistency property appear as limit objects. One example for that is the grandchildren uh, graph. You first take a tree and then you connect every point with its grandchildren. And I won't go into the details of uh, this, but this is a vertex transitive infinite graph. This graph, and uh, let's take the probability distribution where uh, I put the root here, anywhere, doesn't matter, and the probability distribution is concentrated on this single graph. This is obviously random work consistent. Uh, it has this algebraic property. But it turns out that you cannot get this graph as uh, a limit of finite graph. The reason can be explained in a very nice way. Assume that you allowed directed graphs as well. Okay? Then it makes the situation simpler. And then you take this graph, the directed three regular tree, Okay. Well, now it's clear that this cannot be a, a limit of finite directed graph because here every point has all degree two and in degree one, right? And that cannot happen in a finite graph even in an approximative way uh, because the average all degree has to be the average in degree. So, so it, even in an approximative way, it cannot happen. So, so this, can, this is not a, not a limit object. Uh, uh, well, if, if the graphs are not directed, then you have to be trickier than that. But it turns out that this is the analogy of that situation. So that it turns out that there is a condition which is called unimodularity. I, I, I absolutely want to skip this whole thing. And then you, don't, you avoid these examples. But even then, it's not clear that all of those measures come up. And it's a huge open problem. So uh, the open problem would answer answer like uh, five big problems in group theory, for example, if all those measures would come up as limits of finite graphs. There is a paper by Gabor Elek and uh, uh, Szabó uh, that, Andre Szabó, that, uh, that if all the unimodular measures would come up as limits of finite graphs, then that would answer five open problems, some of them 50 years old in group theory. So anyways, uh, so it's an interesting topic. I, I, I would say in this Benjamin Isham topic, uh, there are much more interesting open things than, than known things. It's, a, it's an open area to work on, uh, but, but a tough. It, it is, uh, of course, uh, yeah, so that's right. So it is that. So if you can color, yes, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. So if you can color all these graphs with 10 colors, then there is a way of transporting the coloring process, the, the colorings to the limit. But you will see in the limit 
is not just uh, a distribution on infinite rooted graph, but an distribution on infinite uh, rooted graphs colored with 10 colors. And then, uh, then you, you can see that uh, those graphs are the probability when colorable by 10. Exactly, because, uh, because if the large girls case, so, but there are statements like that. It does. Uh, well, the context, so I would put it this way, the con this context can be used to prove uh, property uh, testing results in a convenient way, but it has a, so it's non-trivial from here. There are, there are papers, one paper I know in this direction is by Gabor Lipner and Gabor Alec. That's a beautiful paper. I think that's their, both are co-authors. Uh, on that, it's, it, it really uses this language to prove various yeah, properties. Uh, they, but they don't, probably they don't use this language. Do, do they use? They use, they they use, use this language. language. Okay, then I take it back. Yeah, but they don't have to prove it. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, other different ways of doing it. I see. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, certain things can be very conveniently formulated. There, are, there is a, an interesting thing in this direction that certain purely graph theoretic results that are measurable, as you uh, continuous in this language, translate into somehow algorithms in the finite world. So there is an interesting correspondence between proving just graph theoretic but measurable graph theoretic results here and constructing some local algorithms in this language. So I, again, it would be a one hour long talk, so I, I cannot even just begin to <laughs> talk about that. But, but there is an interesting uh, uh, correspondence here. Plus, I also have to mention that there is another limit object here, which is more of just a uh, Borel graph on a measure space. So it's a graph on a, on a, let's say, on a compact topological space, which has bounded degree, and plus, say, uh, the edge set is a Borel set of V cross V. It's a bounded degree graph, and there is a probability measure on uh, the compact space. Uh, in that case, uh, this is called a graphing, and it's possible to sample, uh, again, uh, graphs, subgraphs from this graphing, because you have a probability space structure on the vertex set, so you can choose a random point and you get the neighborhood of radius k again. Uh, and that, again, every uh, convergence sequence has a limit object also of that form. It's, it's more familiar because it's a single graph. It's a measurable graph uh, on a probability space. And, and it's also useful to, to, to use that language, but I, again, I skipped that. This was just an illustration of something more general. It's, it could be a sequence of talks, this whole topic. So example three, 
is general graphs. And uh, here, uh, the space, uh, I mean, the sampling process cannot be that one because that would produce an, an infinite of unbounded object if you just pick a random vertex. So the sampling process is that you pick k points independently, uniformly at random. And you look at the graphs spanned on, dot on that uh, on that set, vertex set. So xk is the set of graphs <coughs> on, on the numbers from 1 to k. And, uh, and if you look at the corresponding convergence notion, you just get the graph limit, the dense phase limit uh, notion. Uh, and again, in this case, the, these sampling processes are forming an inverse system, so you can glue together into one single probability distribution. In that case, uh, the inverse limit of these spaces xk will be just uh, the set of all graphs on the vertex set, uh, which is the natural numbers, all natural numbers. So that's the, on the, the inverse limit of xk is just graphs on this set. And it turns out that, again, you, uh, so, so the limit object, okay, is a probability distribution on such infinite graphs. That's one type of limit object that you can consider. And uh, it will be invariant under permutations of these vertices, this probability distribution, obviously, because these are invariant. But there is an extra condition which it satisfies. So it's an S infinity invariant probability measure. It turns out, very interestingly, that you don't get all the S infinity invariant probability measures. But here, fortunately, we understand which one we do get we exactly get the ergodic ones. That's an interesting thing. And this ergodicity can be formulated in a more down-to-earth way in this special situation. And uh, the condition is the following. If you, if you have a probability distribution on, 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 on graphs uh, on the natural numbers, uh, which is a limit, it has to satisfy the following independence property, if you, if you look at the probability distribution on two different, uh, spanned by two different disjoint vertex set, this, what you see here has to be independent from what you see there. It's an independence property. It's true in the finite setting, right? If you, if you cut it into two halves, you look at the induced graphs here and there, it will be independent. So that, that, that extra condition plus S infinity invariance characterizes the, the limit object, but it turns out that that uh, independence property is just ergodicity. Well, it's explicitly true in the finite setting, because if you take uh, the spin. The graphs have to grow to infinity first, of course. Yeah, time. they have to be large, they because are. if you pick, say, k points and l points, uh, then because Um, Unless you think with repetition. Repetition, yeah, that's why. So, so, so if you, you can even just say that you, 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 you just pick them independently, right? So repetition and then you, rep, you create a graph on this infinite. Uh, so for example, if you pick, here is an edge and assume that you pick V1, V2 here and V3, V4 here, then you, the sample will be this. V1 is connected with V3 and V4, and V2 is connected with v, V3 and V4. So this is the sample that you see. This is how you have to think about that. And then there is absolutely no problem here. But it, this problem disappears when, you, when the graphs go to the infinity and then. Uh, oh yes, you can even delete. And that, that will be the same probability distribution. What if you were in somewhere in between of like general graphs and probability graphs? What if the degree is equivalent here in that case? Uh, 
uh, that I don't know. I mean, that, that's an interesting topic to, in this limit uh, notion, this will uh, disappear. So for, to, for this limit notion sees only something interesting if the graphs uh, yeah. have uh, is enough edges. And this, yeah, so anyways. Um, okay, so this was uh, example three. So let's go to example four. Sorry? But normally you say this uh, definition of sequence of graphs converges to a measure of the uh, function on zero, one, and zero. That's a different limit object. It's different, but, but it's, uh, it's equivalent. It captures the same, so, so it's equivalent. It captures, it's, it's a very good uh, question because, uh, so that limit object that I mentioned last time requires some work to prove that it exists. But it's, 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 it's stronger in the sense that once you have that language around that limit object, you can prove more than with this language. This, is, this follows automatically without any effort. You can just glue together this probability distribution and so on. That's why I call this limit object as a trivial, a trivial limit object because you just get it automatically from the context. So all these things are trivial limit objects but in that sense. I mean, so like The graphing, uh, well, depends on uh, what you mean by this question. So in the sense that both type of limit objects can encode this uh, probability distribution, in that sense, they are equivalent. Is there a way from the measurable uh, description to get the probability distribution of the countable one? Yeah, sorry? Yeah. So you can get, from the measurable one, you can get the probability distribution on that's the countable. The, yeah. The Th there is a way, I, I, I tell you, it's, it's actually nice. I, I, I actually, I, I like to talk about this. Um, so this is, uh, assume that you have a measurable function, two variable measurable functions, so on, uh, it's a function on the unit square. Uh, so this is the zero one interval, this is the zero one interval, and the values are between zero and one. So here is the sampling from such an object. We need to define that. It's, it's a two-round two randomization. We first pick uh, randomly and independently elements from the unit interval. Let's say we pick four elements, so this will be a four-element sample. That's the first round of randomization. That's, that way we get a four by four submatrix of this infinite matrix. And we see certain numbers here. Uh, the value of the function uh, uh, is a number, so you get a four by four matrix. So then from this four by four matrix, with a second step uh, of randomization, uh, you create a zero one matrix where you, the zeros and ones are chosen with that so probability. Sym you have to make it symmetric, so you, you only do it for the, this upper half. And you consider that as a sample from this. So that's a random process. Yeah, but uh, you would do it countably then with the negotiation of the distribution on the... And, 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 and you, 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 you would do it with countably many elements. Uh, how do you get the one matrix from the... Uh, you flip matrix. a coin with this five. Independently with these probabilities, you flip a coin and then you get... You, you do it only for the upper half of the matrix to make it symmetric. So, uh, but, but also this is the way how we can interpret SK sampling from this object. And so in that uh, way, it will represent the limit object that it will represent the limiting distributions of SK. The other direction is a bit harder. So, and for that reason, this limit object uh, has more information in it. Now, one has to be careful with this uh, statement that the two limit objects are equivalent. For example, here, the graphing uh, contains more information, actually. And it turns out that it can be interpreted as a limit object, even for a stronger convergence notion that I don't want to go into detail. So, but, but anyway, so, so you can make use of this extra structure that you have measurable set, subset on the, of the probability space. It's actually an interesting topic, very interesting. 
So this is example three and example four I don't even explain because this is just the same thing for hypergraphs. Okay, so I just put here that uh, the same thing can be interpreted for uh, hypergraphs for, for a fixed K and uh, for a fixed uh, M where you look at M uniform hypergraphs. Okay, so fixed uniformity. So a simple graph is a subset of V cross V. Uh, let's say a three uniform hypergraph now is a subset of V cross V cross V, which is symmetric under the permutations of the. Uh, well, you have to. Uh, you can do something like that. You can imagine, but you, you just have to make sure that somehow the neighbors are bounded. That's the only thing. Well, so bounded, bounded it, uh, you have to make sure that when you compute a neighborhood of, of uh, a bounded radius neighborhood, you get a bounded information. But if it's, it has this, then it, then it has this, yeah. In general, so here is the, the, the general philosophy is this. So you have a huge object and the sampling process should give you a bounded object. Once it is bounded, uh, then you can make uh, sense of this and uh, and plus there is this nice fact that every sequence contains a convergent su subsequence because the probability distributions are forming a compact space. So we have this as a bonus that every sequence has a convergent subsequence, which is good for indirect proofs. Assume something is not true and then you take a sequence of counterexample, you choose a convergent subsequence, blah, blah. So that's also a useful thing. But for example, if you have graphs uh, of, uh, let's say, where which has square root of n edges or something like that, it's hard to, or uh, let's say, n to the three half edges. It's hard to create any sampling which gives you bounded information and it's non-trivial. It sees something from that structure. I don't quite see what to do there. So that, that could be an open. Uh, yes, yeah, that's, one can do something like that. Uh, yes, so that, those, most of those don't uh, fit into this context. So let's, let's call, this is a more, this, this I call weak limits local limits where you have the sampling process. It turns out that you can uh, also look at things from the top and look at global properties and then again you can extract compact information but in a global way, not in a local way. <coughs> Let's say you look at uh, the largest, the eigenvectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues, largest 10 eigenvalues, so you have these vectors and let's look at the joint distributions of the coordinates. This is an information which can be done for graphs. Well, uh, this is more like it looks at a global graph from a global perspective rather than a local. So is it? You do some random walk and then you see what, uh, what the union is in space. You can also take a, a branching random walk which has correlations inside. So I. Uh, well, 
that can go on, but the yeah, scheme of it. Yes, and actually I want to get there, so let me, <laughs> I am, um, I explained uh, just a small, small fraction that I wanted to explain in the first part. So I, want, I will skip many things, uh, but I, 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 want to, I want to tell you more, one more example for this, which actually leads to the inverse uh, Gower stuff. And this is an interesting uh, situation because here the, basic objects are more algebraic. Take an abelian group, a finite abelian group. Uh, could be Zn or Z2 to the n. These are interesting objects. And then take a subset or zero one valued function. So the objects are subsets of finite abelian groups. So now what is, the, what is a meaningful sampling process? Um, of course, we, we have seen one for Zn where you take consecutive elements. That's a sampling process, but now what I'm going to do is a radically different sampling process. I mean, it's quite different. Ex exactly, exactly. Any such thing is a, is, is a, is a member of the uh, family. And uh, so how do I sample? Actually, it turns out that there are various sampling processes. Um, but this is the philosophy that first choose uh, random elements, first step, choose A1, A2, and so on, A, N, A, K. So this will be a sampling process S, K. Um, choose randomly, choose these things randomly. And then uh, look at the, diff the, the pairwise sums. So, Okay, so le let, me, let me just uh, make a comment here. I could already do the following, but it's entirely boring. I could just say that, okay, now I have these random elements. I just see whether AI is in S or not. So I get a zero one. Uh, the subset that is given to you, right? The subset of yes, so I have these points, A1, A2, and A3, and so on. What should I call it? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, so what I can do in the first round, that's the most trivial thing, that I just uh, look at, uh, evaluate the characteristic function of t on, on a, and that, that way I get a zero one vector, but this is entirely boring. It doesn't use the structure of the Abelian group at all. But I learned from this sample is the relative density of t. It's from the group, uh, the group with uniform distribution. Uh, it also makes sense, by the way, for compact abelian group, it's crucial where, where the uniform distribution is the higher measure. But here it's just the usual uniform distribution. Okay, so that's, that would be the most stupid thing to do that I just evaluate the characteristic function. But somehow I want to use the additive structure of the group. So I can also add to this information that I evaluate one t at the points AI plus AJ. I look at all the pairwise sums. So that way I get a random matrix, a distribution of matrices on K by K matrices. Okay, and this is already more interesting. It is. 
it, you can look at it that way. So actually that fits Vander Pool into the graph limit framework. Now you can, you can define this as a, you can put this language into the general framework and you get a, a limit concept for subsets in abelian groups. More generally, you can also, instead of considering this subset T, you can also just take any function on the abelian group which takes values between zero and one. Then the sampling space will be uh, matrices where the elements are between uh, zero and one. That's still a compact space and the, the, the limit concept makes sense, okay? So this way we have an interesting limit concept for functions on abelian groups, okay? Now, uh, what I claim, it's, a, it's, a, it's not my final claim, uh, it's just a first claim that the limit object for these uh, things is again a function on an abelian group, a compact abelian group. It, 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 it is not necessarily a finite abelian group anymore. So limit object is uh, a function on a compact abelian group. And let me explain how. So let's stick with these, uh, these objects where I just take uh, subsets of abelian groups first, okay? Even in that case, the limit object will be a function on a compact abelian group, say the circle. Um, in this case, uh, um, I, I want to reproduce uh, the limiting this. So I, I have to tell you in what sense is this able to represent on a compact abelian group. So, or yeah. Do you, do you take the sum, because you said that uh, you want to for the more trivial case of the... Uh, yeah, so I start with this family of objects, which is just subsets in abelian groups. Okay, but you take the sum, so you still do... I take the sum. I, 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 that was just an introduction, so I, the trivial one is... Uh, I thought that you were saying something about that. Well, okay. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I, I, Okay, so there are three levels of difficulty. The first level is when I just evaluate uh, one T on those, but that's a limit object is just a number, which is the relative density of T. That's not interesting. Second level of difficulty, when I have just subsets in the abelian groups, uh, I, that's, let me call it the intermediate difficulty. And the most difficult is, even there will be something which is even more difficult than that, that. But the more difficult is when you also want to understand the limit object of functions on abelian group. That there will be a subtle thing there which happens, uh, an other phase transition of difficulty. But anyways, so in this intermediate case, the limit object is a function from a compact abelian group to the zero one interval. And how do I, uh, in what sense, I have to tell you, uh, in the following sense, you can reproduce this matrix distribution, matrix distributions from here in the obvious sense that you first pick randomly with the higher measure elements in this abelian group, A1, A2, and AK. You look at the pairwise sums, and then you evaluate this function F on that. You get a number, a, a, a matrix distribution, but matrices with values between zero and one, entries between zero and one. And then in a second step, you just randomize that in a similar sense. So it's really a special case of the graph. Uh, this is- Well, the, well, the, well now instead of zero one, uh, the interval zero one is the, for zero one is the, an abelian group. Uh, the, 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 you look the at this special graph. That's, that's, that's right, absolutely, absolutely correct. I, but, but when I will move on, it will change. So I change the perspective. I don't care about the graph. It's like you can make an excursion into the world of graphs, but, but you can explain it without that. Actually, what you have is just a clean limit concept for functions on abelian groups. Uh, for now, I just have a limit concept for subsets in abelian group, but I will get to that. Are completely different? For 
something. Uh, it alternates in a sequence, uh, a group with uh, cyclic and two cyclic at the end? Uh, then you have to choose a convergent subsequence. Yeah, how much in which sequences are convergent? So That's I, I can answer that question. There is a fully analytic answer to that, and I will get to that. It's a, it's a tricky. It's, I, I cannot answer this in one so sentence. The groups also sometimes change, do they not? Uh, the groups change. That's important. If the groups don't change, then you just get back the same group with some so subset. I mean cha so the change in the, so if they are all cyclic, then it's the same, or if they are all basically same, same flows, then things may fly. Uh, yeah, and but you. Uh, let me structure. try to understand, uh, or uh, let you 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 have interesting so you have surprising examples like that. There there is a actually uh, there is a I know a convergent sequence where the groups are this Z P one Z P two cross Z P two and then Z P three alternatingly the, the direct product of two or one, and it will converge, the primes are going, these are prime numbers. It cannot be radically different. I have an understanding of that, a fully analytic understanding. Something interesting is going on. Uh, I, I will go into the details because this is, uh, we are getting closer to the Gauer's norms and the inverse. Is it something, what would be the compact group uh, to the um, It depends on, of course, on the sub. It turns out that the compact group also depends on the subsets, not just on the groups. But depending on the subset, for example, you can get a single circle or a torus or even more complicated objects. So it's very interesting because uh, things like the following can happen. It can happen that the groups on which, uh, let's say, it can happen that you repeat the same group, say the circle, and you have a sequence of functions on the circle. Uh, and the limit object will exist on the torus. This can happen, for example. It cannot happen if you repeat the same cyclic group on the, uh, all the time. Somehow that doesn't explode that way. You get something on Zn, Zn. But if you have uh, subsets of the circle, it can happen that the limit object will exist on the torus. The dimension, there is a dimension explosion here, a very interesting phenomenon. And the, the, there is a nice Fourier analytic answer to this, why that happens. So it's a, it's, a, it's a new limit concept for functions on abelian groups, and it has interesting properties. But uh, so, th but is this clear? So this is how I interpret the limit object. Okay. So now, what if I the next difficulty? What if I want to consider really functions or the limits of functions, not just subsets? What I get is as in the limit is not exactly. It will be still a function on a compact abelian group, but the values won't be from the 0, 1 interval. The values will be probability distributions on the 0, 1 interval. It's still a nice space. It's, it's a compact space, the probability distributions on the 0, 1 interval. Uh, and, and then in what sense is this the limit object? I already talked about so if this is a general function, then I have already matrix distributions here. And uh, on the other hand, if I have such an object, I again can construct a matrix distribution from here because when I do this first round of randomization, I get a matrix where each entry is a probability distribution on 0, 1. And in the second round of randomization, I just flip a coin according to that probability distribution. So I get actually, again, just numbers from the 0, 1. Well, sorry, I have to, it, it doesn't have to be the zero one interval. It can be any, let's say, unit circle of the complex, unit disk of the complex numbers in this case. That's important. So if I have, if I want to understand limits of functions which take complex value in the unit disk, then the limit object will be a compact abelian group plus a function into the probability distributions on the compact unit disk. And in this sense, that if you have such a probability, if you have such a function, then there is a process of two-step randomizations where first you just choose random elements, you take the pairwise sums, you, you then create this matrix, the entries of the matrix are 
probability distributions here. And then in the second round, you just flip a coin according to that probability distribution. You get a complex valued matrix, right? That will be the limit object of functions. Uh, there is a nice projection of this once you have this uh, very interesting information can be obtained by just taking the expectation. That's a simple function uh, to the complex numbers. That's something I, I already interpret as a limit object for uh, um, in, a, in a weaker sense for functions on abelian group. And this has a nice Fourier analytic description. Okay, so, but there is something, obviously I didn't exploit the language uh, fully because I could take triple sums here. And I could even look at all, them, all of them together, the, all the pairwise sums because they are correlated somehow. All this information, I could, I could regard this as a sample, this information together. Now, something really amazing happens. Uh, you cannot formulate this limit object in the category of abelian groups anymore. You have to extend your object to an, or the set of objects to understand the limit uh, to the, the, the limit objects. In the following way, <coughs> and uh, again, it's a bit of a longer story, but I stop at three now. So let me do that. Um, I get a similar answer. The limit object will be a measurable function on something, but it won't be a compact abelian group anymore. It will be a more complicated algebraic structure. Basically what it is, I am slightly lying, but basically there, there are certain problems here. Basically what you get as in the limit is a two-step nil manifold and then a measurable function on a two-step nil manifold. So there are examples where you take functions on abelian groups, you look at the limit object and the limit, limit object will be a measurable function on the, that three-dimensional Heisenberg nil manifold, which is a very interesting thing. So once more. So uh, complex numbers or the distribution from the um, Well, depends on the framework. So if you, for example, just look at subsets and you do that, then you will get a measurable function into the zero one interval. Let's, let's stick with the subsets. Uh, so this, in, the, in that case, this will be a two-step nil manifold, basically. And I am lying in two ways, and I will correct it later, because it's a bit more complicated uh, that, uh, than a two-step nil manifold. Maybe uh, you cannot remind us something, what are the two-step nil manifold? Uh, yes. So here is the example, the prototype of such an object, and then I tell you the general. Uh, but it's really the best way of understanding it is to take this. Take this group a three-dimensional Euclidean space and take this subgroup and this subgroup uh, is not a normal subgroup but it has the property that it's co-compact so if you look at the Cossett space this is the Heisenberg group this is the discrete Heisenberg group so if you look at the Cossett space uh, left Cossett say this is a compact topological space and it's not a mysterious object, it's actually a very down-to-earth object. It's, 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 it's something geometric. Uh, it's a three-dimensional topological space. It has the following structure. You have a two-dimensional torus, and then you blow up every point of the two-dimensional torus into a circle. But it's not done in a trivial way. There is some cohomology which twists that circle. It's a, it's, it's a very well understood structure. It comes up in number theory and... Uh, Theta functions, whatever. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a well-understood object. And uh, there is a way, a, a bit more complicated way of, again, sampling, to, of sampling uh, um, matrices or, or, or three-dimensional matrices for, from this. And at this point, let me skip the definition of that. But it turns out that s some very simple functions on abelian groups 
if you take that finer convergence, they converge to functions on already to two-step near manifolds. And if you increase, let's say, the three to four, then you get three-step near manifolds and so on. It's just a lag that uh, one-step near manifolds are compact abelian groups. So when you sample, when you look at the first sampling process, you again get something on a compact abelian group. But it's just sheer luck. Uh, and actually, the, 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 the difference in the difficulty here is entirely analogous to the difficulty difference between the original regularity lemma and the hypergraph regularity lemma. There is a very close connection that I also wanted to explain. Uh, somehow, this thing that new objects come into the picture uh, when, you, when you go to these more complicated sa sampling processes is related to, to the fact that when you want to regularize a normal graph, then basically you will just look at a partition on the vertices. And the partition of the vertices creates you a density matrix. And the density matrix is again a matrix. Your original graph is a matrix. And the object which you get after regularization, the information is again a matrix. So you don't have to leave the, the, the universe of matrices. Sim in similarly, when you do that for abelian groups, you don't have to leave the universe of abelian groups for the two-fold sums. It's enough to consider abelian groups. But when you want to understand regularizations of hypergraphs, which are like something like three-dimensional matrices, uh, the information cannot be described uh, by smaller bounded three-dimensional matrices. It will be more of a six-dimensional structure rather than a three-dimensional structure. And this is exactly analogous, not surprisingly, because those are hypergraphs as well. So, so it's, it's uh, basically uh, that research somehow branched uh, out from the regular hypergraph regularity lemma. There is, all, all these things are connected. But since you have this extra algebraic structure on the Abelian group uh, that gives you interesting geometric and algebraic structures like the Heisenberg near manifold, which appear in the limit. So the surprising thing also is that uh, you start with commutative structures and in the limit, you get to see non-commutative structures like that. So the Heisenberg group gives you an example it's an example for it's uh, but in general you take a two-step nilpotent group Lie group you take a co-compact subgroup and you do the same thing okay so now i i really want to uh, dive into this uh, Fourier analytic stuff higher order Fourier analysis and inverse stuff <coughs> very quickly so what is the setup in ordinary Fourier analysis So the setup in ordinary Fourier analysis, I just do the compact case. Of course, you can do Fourier analysis on the real line and, and, and so on, no, locally compact abelian groups. But let me restrict myself to compact abelian groups. So let A be a compact abelian group. And we have, uh, of course, the higher measure, which is the unique shift invariant measure on A uh, and uh, there is the dual group A hat which is the set of continuous homomorphisms from A to the complex unit circle and the set of, so the, the, there is a nice duality. If you have a compact abelian group, the dual group is always a finite, is always a discrete abelian group, and there is a Pontragin duality between discrete abelian group and compact abelian group. Now, Fourier analysis, what it does is that if you have any functions uh, on the abelian group going to the complex numbers, which is an L2 function, square integrable function, then you can uniquely write f in this Fourier basis which is chi times the Fourier coefficient which is just the scalar product of f. This is the coefficient. So you, you can write uh, f in this Fourier basis and then this is the Fourier transform. So it, can, it will be an L2 function on A hat basically the function of coefficients. Okay, this is Fourier analysis. Uh, 
And a nice application of Fourier analysis is, is when you want to listen to something, this is how the brain can separate noise from music and the structure, that something is intuitively a noise if all the Fourier coefficients are small. Then you hear it as a noise, basically. Now this type of randomness, noise can be uh, interpreted as a certain type of randomness. It comes up in additive combinatorics in a natural way in the following sense that say, now uh, let A be a finite abelian group. It's already very interesting. Uh, say that S subset of A is quasi-random if the following is true, you take the characteristic function of S and then you subtract uh, the density of S in A, the cons that constant function which just takes the density, then this is fully A random. That means that all the coefficients are small. You can talk about epsilon quasi-randomness. It's epsilon quasi-random uh, if all the Fourier coefficients are at most epsilon. Okay, so what can we say about random subsets of abelian groups in this sense? Uh, the nice fact about them is that certain additive configurations like three-term arithmetic progressions behave in them exactly in the same way as in a random subset with the same density. That's a beautiful fact. Uh, Roth's uh, CRM and the explicit bond is uh, uh, using this information. Actually, it uses something more. Uh, also, if you have a general subset, which is not quasi-random, then basically if you want to understand three-term uh, arithmetic progressions, it's enough to understand the dominant Fourier coefficients and the rest is noise and then it's just a random contribution. That's the high-level philosophy. Um, so basically Fourier analysis is enough to understand three-term arithmetic progressions. It turns out that this is not uh, no longer true for four-term arithmetic progressions. So if, if a subset is quasi-random in this, this sense, Four or, four or uh, higher term arithmetic progressions can have a structure, can behave different, differently from, from a random set. So for this reason, it's very tough to, or seems to be impossible to just understand uh, that through ordinary Fourier analysis to higher term arithmetic progressions. But you can say things, but, uh, but there is a better direction, which was started by Gowers, And uh, Gowers basically uh, suggested that there should be something which is called higher order Fourier analysis, which, which, is, which is the analogy of Fourier analysis, but which is capable of understanding other, all other additive structures. So uh, his basic notation was uh, a sequence of norms, the Gowers norms. which are the following, uh, the so-called, let me introduce uh, the following definition. So if you have a function on an abelian group to the complex numbers, then we can uh, introduce this differential operator delta t, which is uh, delta t of f at point x is equal to fx times fx plus T conjugated. Why do I call it a differential operator? Because if, say, f takes uh, numbers of absolute value 1, then this is a difference operator multiplicatively. So, but you can do it iteratively, and it turns out that if you apply it in this order, then it's the same as if you apply it in the other order. So uh, thanks to this, I can also just say about multi-indices of differential operators. It makes sense. Good. So now I can define the UK norm of a function this is introduced by Gowers. This is the expected value over T1, T2, and so on, Tk 
of delta t1, t2, oh, and I have to put x here. f of x, and this is not a norm. I have to take uh, the uh, two to the case root of this expression, and then it becomes a norm. Uh, because otherwise, if I don't take it, I multiply this with lambda. It will be multiplied by lambda to the two to the k. So it won't be a norm. So uh, it turns out that this, this is a norm. That's a theorem by Galvez. Not hard to prove, by the way. And, uh, <coughs> and if k is at least 3, then these are somewhat mysterious. But if k is equal to 2, then we have a very good understanding of what they mean. And here is the meaning. Um, So the u, uh, the u uh, two norm of f is equal to the L four norm of the Fourier transform of f. So, so this means that you take the uh, sum of the force powers of the Fourier coefficients, uh, and then. Uh, you take the fourth root of that sum. That's it. That's the, that's the correspondence. So in particular, from here, a simple calculation shows that if f is bounded, say, um, for this is enough that the L2 norm is bounded, I guess. Now let, let f be bounded, because otherwise that doesn't make sense necessarily. So I assume that just that f has L infinity norm at most one. By the way, um, in the general situation, if A is a compact group, I have to assume that f is a bounded function to make sense out of it. So it's, it's a norm on the L infinity of the Abelian group. So then we have that uh, the U2 norm is uh, oh, you too. Is sandwiched between the square root of the maximal Fourier, maximal Fourier coefficient and the, the maximal Fourier coefficient. So, so this means that U2 norm is small if and only if it's Fourier random. So the, the U2 norm that it measures is exactly the Fourier quasi-randomness. So this is the first step the first intuition in higher order Fourier analysis is that, okay, so what does U3 measure? Uh, we would say that F has a small U3 norm if it's, if, if it's a noise in the quadratic Fourier, whatever quadratic Fourier analysis means, F, the smallness of F U3 should mean that F is uh, a noise in the quadratic Fourier analysis. Well, there is a way of, uh, there is a language that people use here and it's called an inverse theorem. Uh, we can also equivalently say here that the U2 norm is, <coughs> if the U2 norm is not small, then F has of course a Fourier coefficient which is non-negligible, which means that F correlates with a, with a harmonic function, a Fourier function. So this is the typical way of thinking that if F is, uh, not random, then it correlates with a structure. So what are the structures here? We want to say something like that, that if, if the U3 norm is uh, not small, then it correlates with something which is structure, and, and, and it should be an if and only if statement, and we want to understand what structures are. So there is a speci special situation that was very well understood uh, by Greentow and Ziegler.
And this is the case uh, of uh, functions on subsets of the integers. So this is not the theorem. This green tau Ziegler inverse theorem is not a general theorem for abelian groups. It's a, it's, a, it's a theorem about a very specific situation when the function maps uh, the, so this is the first n natural numbers, that to the complex number, say, and f has absolute value at most one. Okay, so there is some difficulty here. This does not wrap around nicely like a cyclic group. So in their, in their approach, they don't really use a cyclic structure, and they just use an interval-like structure, but then the problem comes up how you define Gower's norm for such an object. My, Definition suddenly doesn't make too much sense anymore. It won't be a norm in that case, but you can make sense out of it in the following interesting way. Uh, you take a large enough cyclic group, which has to be bigger than, so assume that you want to interpret UK norm for such a function. Uh, then you can put your, uh, you can represent your function in a large enough cyclic group where you, evaluate the function on a, an interval of length n and assume that the, 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 the abelian group has size uh, bigger than uh, 2 to the k times n, I guess. Sorry? Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. You must be right. Uh, anyway, so you, you put it into a large enough abelian group, you calculate the Gower's norms, but then you have to normalize it, and what you normalize with is just the Gower's norm of the characteristic function of that uh, interval. And that won't depend on the size of the cyclic group that you embed. So that, that's, a, that's a Gower's, that's again a norm for such functions. And the famous green tau Ziegler uh, inverse theorem provides a beautiful answer for such functions. And uh, my goal was to come up with something which, which tells you a general inverse theorem for every compact table and group. You mentioned you, you want to know what to correlate if it's not correlated. Uh, exactly, and I will tell you that answer in a second. I, I just want to say that the, the goal of this talk that I'm giving now is to say that there is a more general answer for general compact table and groups. Uh, which also uses somehow nicely the periodic structure of the groups. And it, it actually, if you want to uh, uh, state that theorem, some interesting new algebraic structures come into the picture, which are useful here. If you start with a function of extremely many solids, you get your limit. Sorry? If you start not with function of on compact group, but functions of extremely many solids. Oh, yeah, that, that again, the, the theory that I'm going to present works. It goes, so it's a general theory for functions, any functions, near manifolds and things like that. So it's a generalization of the green tau Ziegler theorem. Um, now, but let me go back to the green tau Ziegler theorem to, to state what it is. Uh, basically, their statement is that if the UK norm is non-negligible, then it correlates with a, a K minus one step nil sequence. These k minus ones are always confusing in this subject. There is k and k minus one, and you have to. <laughs> so u2 is always a first order Fourier analysis. u3 is the second order Fourier analysis. Um, so that is a nil sequence. The nil sequence is derived from a nil manifold. So assume that you have a k step uh, nil potent Lie group. age and co-compact subgroup in age, then there is, uh, we have a near manifold, let's say left cosset space, and we can then choose uh, an element x from n, an element t from h, and a function on this nil manifold. And then the nil sequence is 
uh, just simply evaluating this function on the orbit of x. So keep in mind that t is still acting on this space. It's a homogeneous space of h. So we can look at this sequence fx, ftx, ft squared x, and so on. This will be. What happened in the case of first and third order? Precisely. Precisely. T is an element from the group. And X. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So, so this is a near sequence, but of course this is not the precise statement because they have to say that if it's separated from zero, then it correlates with a bounded complexity near system. Again, it's it's analogous. Uh, okay, I will come that to later to regular dilemma, uh, where you have want to reduce something to bounded complexity object. So bounded complexity nil uh, sequence just means that everything has bounded complexity here. Uh, there are countably many such situations. So you can say that you list all the situations and it has a bounded index. So in other words, everything is bounded, the dimension is bounded, and uh, the structure, the constants which describe the structure are bounded, so on. Um, the, even that uses ultra products, so it's not effective. Ev unfortunately, things in this area are not effective, they should be effective. There should be a quantitative theory of all of this, which, which would be really amazing. Uh, so, so there is a bounded complexity situation, f is of bounded complexity, it's, it's a continuous function, I, I forgot to say that. Continuous and, and it doesn't change too much. The Lipschitz constant is bounded. So it's basically it's faithful to the structure of the near manifold. So in that situation, uh, we say that it's of bounded complexity and then there is a bound on the complexity if you, depending on how much, depending on the value of the Gaussian. It's a beautiful theorem because it relates the Gaussian norms to that, those things. But what I'm saying is that there are two problems with this. It uh, first of all, it doesn't provide a general understanding for compact Abelian groups. Uh, there are ma many other interesting things. You want to have something for Zn, which is, uh, uh, which, how should I put it? So first of all, you want to, you want to have uh, more general statements. If you, you also want to understand what you have uh, if you have uh, a multidimensional so thing. Well, it's a 120 pages long lemma. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, that's right. So they, but, but, so the thing here is that one would think that if, I mean, there is a generalization of higher order free analysis. It should be interesting independently. I mean, it shouldn't be just as a, it shouldn't be just a lemma. It should be something really interesting. Um, and I think that method doesn't even work because uh, the statement has to be modified. This statement is no longer true for the general situation. Near sequences are not enough. Some other algebraic structures come into the picture, which are slight generalizations of near manifolds, if you want to understand the general situation. So, and it's interesting on its own right that these algebraic structures are forced upon us. So let me now uh, leave it as it is and just tell you something interesting, uh, an algebraic theory, hopefully I can explain it in, in a few minutes. Uh, it's an underlying algebraic theory and I, I, my claim will be that higher order Fourier analysis considers morphisms from Abelian groups to those algebraic structures, whatever they are, uh, and not just the unit circle in the complex plane. The problem with near sequence is they, they don't really come from, from morphisms. It's, it's, it's something, uh, it's, so for example, if you want to interpret it on cyclic groups, it's, there is no periodicity here and things like, you don't get back even ordinary Fourier analysis from this statement. You don't get characters. So, so I want to have something which is more algebraic than that. And it exists a very algebraic approach to all these things, uh, but, uh, but, Quite interestingly, some new algebraic structures have to be defined, but these algebraic structures are pretty simple uh, and simpler than near manifolds. That's the good news. 
and still they are related to near manifolds. Okay, so what are these algebraic structures? I call them nil spaces. And the name is just uh, there because they are related to near manifolds, but they are much simpler objects. They, they are combinatorial, in some sense very combinatorial. Um, <clears throat> so near spaces uh, are generalizations of abelian groups. Uh, if you, let, let me just first start with some motivation here. So abelian groups have this nice feature that cubes, the, the abstract notion of a cube can be defined in an abelian group. You have x, you have then x plus t1, x plus t2, and so on. So this is an abstract cube. It's, it doesn't have to be considered an inhomogeneous object. Here I have a distinguished vertex x, but the abstract notion of a cube makes perfect sense. The, the defining equation is that uh, on every two-dimensional face, the alternating sum has to be zero. That's an abstract cube in an abelian group. So abstract cubes satisfy certain axioms in an abelian group. <coughs> what kind of axioms? Let me, and I just want, I will just slightly modify that axiom system I, and I will exactly get my U axiom system, which is exactly required for higher order Fourier analysis. So I just want to have a different point of view on abelian groups. So an, a combinatorial cube is just a cube of this form. Now, combinatorial cubes are forming a category in a very simple way. So don't be scared by the, no, the, the word category. I just want to have some morphisms between combinatorial cubes. And the morphism is a function which extends as an, as an affine morphism, homomorphisms from Zn to Z to the n. So it's a geometric embedding. What is an affine homomorphism? It's just a homomorphism plus a shift. But since many of you are combinatorists, I can tell you an entirely combinatorial description without homomorphisms, it's just the, in the coordinates. Uh, so what is a, how, how do I understand uh, nice uh, functions between combinatorial cubes? Well, uh, they, they are, I have to understand the coordinate functions and I allow four kinds of co coordinate functions. Every coordinate function is either a coordinate from here or one minus a coordinate from here or just constant zero or constant one. These are the morph, these are exactly the maps that extend to homomor affine homomorphisms between Zn and Zn. Okay, so now I have the notion of uh, the, the morphism. So for example, this is a morphism. You have a three-dimensional cube and there's a diagonal object you embed a two-dimensional cube in it. Exactly, so for example, this is a good map. x1, x1, 1 minus x2, 0, and 1. So, uh, now, there are tri three trivial things which these, uh, I mean the third one is the least trivial, these cubes satisfy. Uh, I will think of these cubes in the abelian groups. So this is the language that I'm going to use. I will introduce morphisms or cube. A cube in an abelian group will be a map from the zero one cube to the abelian group. It's just a way of, of, of parametrizing the vertices with a combinatorial cube. So, so this is what I mean by a, a cube in an abelian group. So basically the thing is that the vector v1, v2, and so on, vn, goes to uh, x plus sum of vi, ti for some fixed uh, 
uh, set of these, right? This is how I can parameterize. So, so this is the language I'm going to use. The cubes are uh, interpreted as functions from a combinatorial cube. So what do they satisfy? They satisfy the obvious thing that if you have a morphism between two cubes and then you have, and the second map is a cube in the Abelian group, then the composition is a cube. So this is a morphism. This is just a cube in the Abelian group, then it's a cube. Okay, trivial, entirely trivial. Second trivial thing that they satisfy. Uh, every map from the one-dimensional cube is a cube. Okay, that's again Abelian group satisfy that. That's, that's easy. Uh, now here comes the third one. By the way, this is what I call for, for a good reason ergodicity. In some sense it's analogous to ergodicity in a deep way. Uh, this is just uh, called a pre-sheave over the category of cubes, if you like that language. I, pr I assume you don't, but <laughs> it's very simple, so we don't need to make it look complicated. But the third one is interesting. That, that's, that's the interesting thing. If you have a corner of a three-dimensional cube, so you have this geometric shape, okay? And you, and you have a map from this into an Abelian group such that the restrictions to each three uh, faces are already cubes in the Abelian group. So the restrictions, so this is phase one, this is phase two, this is phase three. So if you have a map uh, F with the property that, sorry, I have to make some space here, if you have a map with the property that f restricted to f1 is a cube in the Abelian group, f restricted to f2 is a cube, and uh, also the third one is a cube, then you can extend this map into the full three-dimensional cube, right? That's a, again a property that Abelian group, and in fact there is a unique extension So this implies that there is a unique extension to the three-dimensional cube, which is a cube. Good. Um, in this. Yes, but, but, uh, but for my claim, uh, le let me, yes, so in this case for Abelian groups, yes, but uh, I still claim that you can get these, these things, if you, if you formulate it in this way, then they characterize Abelian groups. I think in that sense it's not enough. So there is a reverse direction. If you assume these axioms, then what you get exactly the set of affine Abelian groups. And uh, nothing more, nothing less. There is no distinguished zero, but apart from that, you get Abelian groups. Okay? Uh, now here comes the only twist I make to this, and this is a K-step near space. And again, before I te tell this, let me mention that ordinary Fourier analysis basi basically looks at morphisms from Abelian groups to a specific Abelian groups, the circle. It turns out that if I want to understand higher order Fourier analysis, I have to change that circle into some more general structure. So if I want to understand case order Fourier analysis, I will modify this axiom system and the, in, a, in just one sentence, and then you get case order Fourier analysis essentially. Uh, and the modification is this. I just, I just increase this three to uh, K plus two. I say that if you have a, corner of a k plus one dimensional cube, k plus two dimensional corner of k plus two dimensional cube, then there is a unique com and, and a function which, is, which has the property 
then there is a unique extension. Same thing, I just increased the dimension. Nothing, I didn't change too much here, just that. By, by communist, you manage the quantity. Exactly. So you have the k plus one, k plus two dimensional cube, you delete that point, you have the, those, those k plus two faces, uh, hyper uh, planes, if, you, if restricted to that, the function is a cube, then there is a unique extension. It's weaker, this implies that for higher case, but the other direction is not true. So it's a weakening of the axiom system, you get more structures. And this is what I call k-step near spaces. And it turns out, I, I can also introduce the notion of a compact k-step near space, that will be important here. Compact k-step near space is something where these, uh, the set of cubes, set of k-dimensional cubes in A is a subset of A to the 0, 1 to the k. If you look at all possible functions that will be, a, the, the, the cubes will be a subset of that, and this has to be compact. So A has to be a compact topological space and all these sets have to be compact as well. So A is so compact just means that for, for sorry? If this, if these are satisfied with A, then A is an Hilbert space, a K Hilbert space. So, so a K-step nil space is just something which satisfies this axiom with K plus two. Something is an A, not K. Is it something? Oh, 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 oh. sorry, N. Let me, so, so this, this, I want to define when a, a, a nil space oh, N, a K-step nil space uh, is compact. All those, so the cube sets are compact sets. So, so there is n there too. Uh, yes. So n, no, 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 n is the zero. Set of uh, n dimension. Oh. But let me let me put here an n no, because. Capital a down there. And this is n. Okay. So all the cube sets are compact. A, the the set n is compact. And so it's just a technical notion. It turns out that, so here is the theorem. So you can work out the theory of compact topological nil spaces. These are generalizations of abelian groups and it's of independent interest. It doesn't seem to uh, have any relation for the first look to higher order Fourier analysis, but uh, we did that with Omar Antolin. Kamaran M, my former student, he's still a PhD student. So we worked on these nil spaces, we worked out the theory of them. Uh, it's actually a 60 pages long algebraic theory, but it, it, it's self-contained. So it's just the algebraic theory of these objects. And it turns out that these are nice objects. They have the following structure. If you take a two-step nil space, then it has this uh, structure that you have a compact abelian group, A1, and then you blow up every point to a second, but same abelian group, A2. So it's a, fi fi it's a bundle over an abelian group with another abelian group, A2. So these are two structure groups. And there are certain other properties that they satisfy. But there is a crucial theorem which comes up after 50 page of work that these k-step nil spaces are inverse limits of k-step nil manifolds in some sense if they are connected. And I have to make sense of it. So a connected K step. Now, so uh, let me take a step back. I, any. Uh, so, any. I, I actually wanted to state two theorems at once, but I let me separate them. So, first, any K step compact nil space is the inverse limit. of finite dimensional ones. What do I mean by inverse limit? In this category, what is a, ma a morphism between two k-step nil spaces is just a cube preserving map. If, if you have a cube in, 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 in the first one and you compose that with the map, then it's a cube in the second one. Cube preserving maps are the morphisms. And in that category, it's an inverse limit. So it's enough to understand finite dimensional nil spaces. And the CRM two, is that finite dimensional nil spaces 
if they are connected, they are neomanifolds, k-step neomanifolds. So, so you don't have to work with neomanifolds in this new language because a CRM guarantees that they are related to neomanifolds, and then you just focus on that simply are combinatorial structures. Oh, like Euclidean dimensions. So if it's if finite dimensional as a topological space. But there is an algebraic way of defining the dimension. But you just think of it as a topological space. Uh, so connected components are uh, if of a finite dimensional, if n is finite dimensional, then connected components are just near manifolds. And again, there is something here, some, some extra detail that near manifolds are themselves are, are not clear how to, how to make them uh, a cube space. We don't, one has to define the notion of cubes in near manifolds. And that doesn't come automatically. You, it's not enough to work with the nilpotent group age and the co-compact subgroup gamma. You have to choose some filtration of age, a central series. But I don't want to go into the details. It's almost specified by the group how to put a cubic structure on it, but you have to specify some chain of subgroups which is a central series, and then there is a unique way of putting a cubic structure. And basically, the, the, the classification theorem says that these connected things are coming from nil spaces. So now, in, in my inverse theorem, we can forget about nil uh, manifolds because I have the notion of a nil space, which is more general than that. In some cases, they, these are not connected, and the, they, they have an extra structure. They are not just nil manifolds. You have more. In the special case, when it's a finite dimensional and connected, then it is coming from a nil manifold, but it's not necessarily connected, and it's also interesting. It turns out that this notion is enough, it is sufficient to prove uh, a completely general inverse theorem for the Gauer's norm, so an arbitrary compact tabellian group. Uh, and the inverse, it, and it's actually not just an inverse theorem, it's a regularity lemma. So basically, it's a much uh, stronger thing to do. I mean, it's, it's much stronger to state a regularity lemma for a function than an inverse theorem. Let me, let me uh, tell you what I mean by that. Um, so going back to graphs, assume you, you know that you know what the cat norm is for graphs. The cat norm is that uh, we have a matrix, and then we, we look at uh, the sum of the entries on all possible product sets. We normalize it by, so if it's an n by n matrix, we normalize it by n squared. We look at the absolute values of these sum of the entries, and then we take the supremum of that. This is the so-called uh, cat norm, normalized cat norm. And uh, bank, the inverse theorem, the analogy of the inverse theorem would be the following. If the cat norm for a matrix is non-negligible, then it correlates with a product set like that. Right? It's an entirely trivial statement. This is how I defined. You can also define the cat norm by the C4 density, the taking the fourth root of the C4 density, then it's a less trivial statement. If the C4 norm is non-negligible, then it correlates with the product set. Okay, that's an inverse theorem. But obviously, it's much stronger if I, if I say that I can decompose any function into a, a completely block form and some other function which is entirely quasi-random, has a very small cat norm. It's a structure theorem, it's not just a correlation thing. So, so the, the goal of higher order free analysis is not just to prove an inverse theorem, it's to prove a regularity lemma for functions on abelian groups. And since I have one minute left, I just te tell it in a nutshell what it means. And if you, if you know how, sorry? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, tell a little bit about the theory of regularity lemmas in general. Now that I mentioned this cut norm, let me formulate summary of this regularity lemma. Ex Uh, there is a way of doing that, uh, but 
the va va basically what you want to have is an arbitrarily strong regularity lemma in your sense. So there is this Alon Fisher, Kivilevay Sagedi, my brother Sagedi paper where the, there is a strong regularity lemma and we want to formulate strong regularity lemmas. It still is possible, but you have to go through a certain process. And let me, the version that I like uh, how to formulate a strong regularity lemma, it turns out that there is a general language to formulate strong regularity lemmas, a certain language that I prefer. And this is the following, uh, assume, so for an arbitrary strong regularity lemma, we want to, uh, why I'm putting it on the blackboard is because I want to formulate a similar regularity lemma for functions on abelian groups. So I, 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 I want to insist on this form. So for every function, an arbitrarily decreasing function from the natural numbers uh, to the positive numbers and epsilon, uh, there exists a constant n such that for every uh, matrix, a matrix is just a function from v cross p to the complex numbers, say, uh, with absolute value at most one. There is a decomposition into a structured part, an error term, and a random looking part. So this is the general form of a regularity lemma in my life. Such that various things hold. Uh, the F, let me start with the error term. The error term has L2 norm. Every, everything is normalized here. So I, I look at the uniform probability measure on V. So it's a normalized L2 norm, uh, is at most epsilon. The structured part has complexity C, which is at most N. Let me tell you what it means uh, later. Ah, no, I tell it now. So complexity at most N means that Fs has the form that is the composition of two functions, uh, age and the morphism m. So m is a function from v cross v to uh, some set u cross u, where u has size uh, c. It's, it's a different way of formulating a partition. If you have a product if you have a map phi from v to a small set u, and you look at the map phi cross phi, that will define you a partition, a block partition of the. Sorry. And h is a function from u cross u to the complex number. So, but why I'm putting it in this form is exactly because this fits into a more general framework. In general, you want to understand regularizations of functions on algebraic structures. And the, the philosophy is always that you first, the bonded complexity is that you map the algebraic structure with an algebraic map into a small complexity thing. And then on that small complexity thing, you have some function. You can put even the hypergraph regularity in this context. It is tricky, but I can do that. And, and some new algebraic structures come up. There is a nice general theory here. But anyways, so uh, this is the complexity, okay? Uh, this is just the number of parts. So in other words, in a down to earth language, this is just a step function with that many steps. <clears throat> but this I call the algebraic part of the function and this other, the age is the analytic part. And that, that's, a, that's an interesting thing here. Uh, and uh, finally, the cut norm, that's the interesting thing, the cut norm of the random part is at most uh, F substituted by the complexity. It depends on the complexity of the, uh, of the structured part. So it can be an arbitrarily decreasing function in terms of the complexity. And uh, 
So this is the version of regularity lemma that uh, which can be used for hypergraph regularity lemma as well. If you formulate it carefully, you, it, it actually expresses an arbitrary strong version of the hypergraph regularity lemma. Uh, but higher order Fourier analysis can be put into this framework as well, where now you have to replace uh, these. Not you don't have to change too much here. Uh, you, you replace these objects. Here the algebraic structures are the product sets. So you replace that by just an abelian group, okay? You replace uh, this stays as it is. Complexity stays as it is. I have to say, say a few words about that. This stays as it is, but I have to change the morphisms here. It will be a morphism from an abelian group to a k-step nil space. That will be the space of regularization, a continuous map. Uh, age is just a function on that k-step near space, a continuous function of bounded Lipschitz constant. So the complexity of the near space, again, one can prove that there are only countably, it's a theorem, there are countably many near spaces up to isomorphism, you can order them and this is a bounded element on the list. Uh, I'm just saying that I don't change too much here and the crucial thing is that I replace the cat norm by the u uh, k minus one norm. And basically, let me see, so, so that's it. You replaced v cross v by a and uh, I think that's it. So it's just, a, uh, you know, I use the same language for regularity lemma, lemmas and, uh, and I, I, I just uh, replace the category in which I look at the algebraic map. So the regularity lemma has this algebraic part, the map from V cross V to U cross U. So these product sets are forming a category and basically we compose uh, some function on U cross U with a morphism. That's how I create the regularity lemma. Uh, in, this, in this case, the situation is similar. We have this category of uh, these new spaces and you can formulate the uh, inverse theorem in that category. So where, where is the Linux language used? I mean, it's discussions about, uh, I thought, it first you talked about the limit objects of a subset of functions or on, on a billion group. Yeah. Here you have one uh, a billion group, or this is already the, the limit object. Uh, no. Because the uh, segments are about finite. Right? This is about finite. You can, you can restrict yourself to finite. Yeah, so, so where is the limit uh, used in this? Uh, yeah. In the proof. In the proof. Yeah. And, and the thing is the following. You uh, assume that it's not true. You take an ultra, a, a, a sequence of functions where it's getting worse and worse. So where there is no such... Oh, this n is an infinite object, but it's still a reasonable. It's maybe the Heisenberg new manifold or something like that. But 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 for the proof, you need to uh, go through a, a machinery which uses so limits. You started describing. So you say, say you are going from the example to this. Uh, so, yeah, I assume there is no such n, and then for every n there is a counterexample. You take the ultra product, of, ultra limit of that situation. You get some huge. Uh, so you go up to a huge monster. So you have these reasonable structures, uh, counterexamples. Then you go up to this uh, ultra product space. And from here, you descend to still an infinite object, but again, a reasonable object as a factor. You use the notion of a factor again. Uh, and you get a nil space, a compact nil space. It's a factor in the same dynamical Absolutely. Uh, one has to be careful. Uh, factor with respect to certain operations with cubes. Right. So you have to, so I guess, uh, so for this monster, there will be uh, whatever action, like in uh, normal dynamical systems, you have a cyclic action, and there is a graph model you have the, in Benjamin Strong, you have the shift object. So also, I, have, a, I have some a action. Right, uh, exactly. I don't, this, this, this will be a function on an abelian group, but I don't use the usual shift action. I use something which is related to the cubic structure. But anyways, it's a factor in that sense. And then I can identify 
a near space. So the advantage of this, that this is a huge object on which uh, these near spaces naturally live, because how do you, you know, the, the problem is this, uh, for this theorem, you need to create somewhere a, an object like the Heisenberg near manifold. You, you have Abelian groups, finite Abelian groups. How do you get a topological object like that? You find a way, um, that's more like the green towards Ziegler way, to build up something from, but still they use uh, ultra product language, but in an entirely different way. It's more like constructing. Uh, my approach is that somehow they just appear as factors. You, I take a large enough space and you can just pinpoint that there it, is, there it sits, and then you descend to that factor. Uh, but also, so the, their language is different in so many ways that they don't work with new spaces. I can prove that new spaces are really necessary if you want to understand the general situation for compact tables. You cannot uh, get around, they really appear so in the limits, so you cannot get around that if you want to have a uh, general inverse theorem. So, but this is the theorem, this is the approach which also works for summary this regularity lemma in a much, much, much simpler way. It's a few lines, I can prove it modulo, in non-standard integral and measure theory, the, that kind of summary this regularity lemma in just uh, five lines using the same philosophy that first take graphs and go to this ultra product and then project it to a certain sigma algebra which corresponds to the Kronecker factor. Again, but, but this still uses no estimates. No estimates, exactly. That, I just want to uh, point out that the, remember I had that Kronecker factor where the projection down to that Kronecker factor gives you a, a decomposition. So going back to this measure preserving system, so I had this situation x a, a mu and the measure preserving transformation and I wanted to understand certain averages related to three term arithmetic progressions. So what I did, I started with an f and then we projected this f down to this Kronecker factor and this function is enough. Let me call it the structured part of f. So now let me also introduce that there is a random part which is f minus the structured part, okay? So now I have a decomposition f is equal to the structured part plus the random part. And this decomposition uh, is entirely analogous to summary this regularity lemma. You project down to a sigma algebra, the projection is the structured part and the re remaining term is the random part. And, and it's enough, when you do counting, it's enough to understand the structured part. That's the counting lemma. Again, it turns out that if you use this non-standard language for summary this regularity lemma, you just go to this limit language, you project down to a certain very simple sigma algebra, that will be the structured part corresponding to summary this regularity lemma, and the remaining part is the random part. You get some error term when you go, when you finitize it. Uh, if you're just interested in, in the Abelian, in functions from F2 to the N to uh, you know, the precise one, you're interested in correlations with various polynomials, um, you know, where this inverse theorem is true. Do you, do you get a regularity lemma in terms of correlations in that setting? Regularity lemma in terms of, so, so is there how a much? Regularity Sorry? Is, is there a regularity of green in this context that David's talking about? Regularity of green. I'm not sure I'm getting the question. In this cluster, is all you really get on this cluster? In this case. Yeah. Oh, there's fractions of probability. Sorry? Z2 to the, the N. So Green's regularity lemma go belongs to the family of regularity lemmas when you just in, uh, you are interested in the U2 norm. So that's a Fourier analytic thing. And I'm not sure I remember the statement precisely. Green himself told me that if I formulate my regularity lemma for the U2 norm is more similar to something that Burgen showed. But I think the Green statement is very similar to I that. Okay. As your group, what, uh, what uh, elements, what objects that you uh, are correlated with something that has a high uh, U K norm? Yes, are yes, they yes. Just uh, state polynomials, uh, semi um, uh, I 
to, so there are so the objects which appear uh, are near finite near spaces which are composed entirely from z twos. So it's an entirely finite object composed of z twos, and uh, I am. Uh, what I could, okay, so I, I, I tell you what I could very easily derive from this regularity lemma. And to be honest, the Z2 case, I, it requires some extra work to go to phase polynomials. But what I very simply could derive from this is the high characteristic uh, inverse theorem for the Gauss norms. So le let me tell you what it immediately implies. It implies the Green Tower Siegler theorem in a multi-dimensional in a, in a multi setting. It implies the Tau Ziegler high characteristic inverse theorem for uh, Zp to the n in a very simple way. In a, oh, the high characteristic is that if k is fixed and p is bigger than k plus 1 or something like that, then, then it actually just correlates with an ordinary polynomial, phase polynomial. And, and that's actually from this regularity lemma it follows uh, in a f on a few pages. Basically, what you want to do is the following. You, you get already a statement that it correlates with, with such a function, which goes through a bounded complexity near space. And we have a very good understanding what a bounded complexity near space is. And then you just uh, do some computation with that and understand that that really means that it correlates with a phase polynomial. And that goes, I checked that, and that goes really nicely in the high characteristic case. Uh, I also, I didn't put too much effort into it. I, I also uh, checked that in the low characteristic case, it, it, corres it correlates with something which is almost a phase polynomial. And again, I don't, I, I can't tell you in person. It's basically not quite. <coughs> it could be that, I, this is something I still have to check that, whether it implies in a simple way that it correlates with the phase polynomial. No, that's the good thing about it, that there is a theorem by Gödel. It's an amazing theorem. No, yes and no. So the, the interesting thing is the following. I just learned about it a few years ago from logicians. There is a theorem by Gödel which says that if you prove an arithmetic statement using the axiom of choice, there is an algorithm which eliminates the axiom of choice from your proof. So basically, this is something that logic should be useful. So this is a, an amazing application of logic because it, it basically gives you a, an, a subroutine that you can use in the proof, the, the axiom of choice. And then there is another algorithm which transforms your proof into a much, much larger and astronomical. Yeah. Most statements are arithmetic, basically. <laughs> I don't remember the exact definition. So you are not allowed to use some set. I'm not claiming anything here about uh, that uh, cardinalities and things like that. I just, this is. <laughs> Sorry? I, I would believe, I'm not sure, but I would believe so. I even have an intuition how to make such things uh, effective to, to, to give a bond, but that would be a terrible bond, really, really bad bond. So I wouldn't like to do that. I'm not sure in the, in the additive case, it, I mean, this is a different regular. I think in the Fourier analysis case, I mean, for the. Yeah, so there are two different issues here. One is the regularity lemma, which depends on an arbitrarily decreasing function, so your bound will depend on that. That, that there is the inverse, if you just go for the inverse theorem, I believe that there is a good bond, a, a, a reasonable bond for the inverse theorem. The regularity lemma 
qualitatively is stronger than the inverse theorem, but quantitatively it may be true that uh, in the inverse theorem you can get a better bound. And that's an, inter that's, that's an absolutely interesting question. Um, the problem with that, I, I have something for the U2 norm case. There I can understand this uh, space of limit objects through ordinate. There is, a, there is a very nice, neat description in terms of Fourier coefficients, and then I can state something like that. It's related to some Gromov-Hausdorff convergence of groups. It's, it's really beautiful, but in the higher order case, I don't know anything like that, and the problem goes back to the hypergraph regularity lemma. Even in the hypergraph regularity lemma, which is related, and but a simpler situation, I don't know of a nice description like that. Of course, we can make something artificially, but it won't be very nice. So I, I don't know anything natural in that sense. The one problem is that the um, somehow this cut norm has some analogy in the hypergraph case, the cylindric norm, but it doesn't have all the nice properties of the cat norm. So not, not, there is a problem here. I suggest to continue the discussion. Yeah. <laughs>